Oh, big stretch. If I was if I was a dog or a cat, you would have said, "Oh, big stretch." When I stretched, then. Are you tickling there? Hello. Little air, air testes. Little air taint. Little no. <laughs> tickling taints, indeed. <laughs> Welcome, you are, Gabriel. Gabriel. That's, see, that's, that's going to be, by the time this goes out, that's going to be such an old reference. Well, it is an old reference already. No, but like, because he's not even Cardinal Cope here anymore, is saying, he? It is it's a... double old, triple old. Do, 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 triple old. Do, do, do. Like these reviews, which you guys are watching uh, 12 years after this series came out. Wow. That's insane. 12 years after we watched it, because we make these so far ahead. No. Because this man is prepared for the worst. And the best, uh, like this. Dog's Ear Review! It's a visual podcast, that's why you can't see us properly, but, you know, it's just something to own in the background, and occasionally we might do something in vision, so just, you know, just deal with it. Um, you're laughing about what happened just before we recorded, aren't you? No, I'm laughing at that. Have you just noticed what's going on? She's having a little breakdance. Ah, ah, but she's also chained up. She's got a manacle on. Yeah, she Because that's really, a layer. She looks really uncomfortable. Good! Right. She nearly starts a war! A war! A war! Uh, I'm Chris. I'm not Chris. And we're today talking about the Hungry Earth and Cold Blood and Hunger Vincent. Games. Vincent and the Doctor. Jeez, that's a reference that's going to date this video. So this video was made Jeez in 2017. Who talks about the Hungry Games anymore? I really? can tell you. Um, no one. No one. This episode is not sponsored by Mars, but I do have a tiny little... <laughs> you can say, this video is not sponsored by The Hunger Games. <laughs> no, definitely not, Christ. Uh, I have on my person, as do you, some little um, chocolate treats. Um, a chocolate treat. Well, there's two. You've got Twix, and I've got Mars. Because we're recording this on the 2nd of the October. Second day of... It's not, it's the 2nd of November. Did you say that by accident? I said it on purpose, see no, if you you're paying didn't. attention. No, you didn't. On the 2nd of November, because two days ago was Halloween, 31st of October, and series 13 of the modern run started, the Halloween apocalypse. It was a piece of telly. So, uh, let's let's talk about this I piece of telly. I it was on. It was written, so the Halloween apocalypse was on, there's some really cool ideas in it, I just wasn't really a fan of the execution. I felt like it was throwing everything and the kitchen sink into part one in a way that didn't feel cohesive. Maybe as the series goes on, I will retroactively be like, do you know what? As a, as a whole, that series was really enjoyable. But as a part one, I wasn't a big fan. Which is a shame, because <laughs> I'd really like to write... I'd really like to really love something that Chris Chibnall has written. So The Hungry Earth was written by Chris Chibnall. And is... <laughs> Can I put my feet on you? If you want. Did you know that, by the way? Yeah, because well, you mentioned it. It's not a pun at the time. Uh, this is his... I, if I'm Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I think this is his second Doctor Who script. Um, <gasps> after 42. He worked a lot more on Torchwood. Um, I think Broadchurch Series 1 is not that much longer after this as well. So. What did he do Broadchurch? He's, yeah, he created and uh, wrote the majority of Broadchurch. Um, up front, I really like this two-parter. In fact, this yeah. is a two-parter I like more the more I revisit it. Oh, what a lovely bird. Excuse me. <laughs> this is a two-parter I like more the more I revisit it. I've, I've, we're in this period of stories now where um, I had to analyse them a few years ago for Doctor Who magazine when I was part of the Second Time team. Uh, which was unceremoniously executed before uh, we could finish season six of the modern era. You guys got up to um, the Rebel Flesh and the Almost People. We had written up to uh, Night Terrors, so three stories after that, in terms of our contribution to the article. Um, uh, and we were paid per published article, so we didn't get paid for those ones. He's spilling some tea right now. Spilling a little bit of tea, but do you know what? <laughs> Over shit. Uh, I've quite openly talked about it before in other places, and I'll do it here. Um, point is, uh, we covered these in an, in an analytical bent when I worked there. Yeah. So that was about five years ago. Feels four like years. Four. Yeah, five years ago. By the time this is broadcast, it'll be about five, just over five years since I last looked at this story. I have watched this story since. I remember so at some point I randomly watched a lot of Series 5. 
You just put it on sometimes, don't you? Not this story, but no, Doctor no, Who. Doctor yeah. Who in general. Well, not so much in the last three years because of this you marathon. Did it the other day. Well, the other day I was doing it because I was rewatching Re- uh, Revolution of the Daleks ahead of <laughs> of uh, Flux starting because I wanted to kind of just recap what and the just... last story was because I'd only watched that story on transmission and I was I honestly couldn't really remember much about it other than the stuff I hadn't really enjoyed. Mm. So I wanted to watch it again. I'd see if my opinion changed. It didn't change that much. But um that a good thing or there are gonna be people watching this now going, Oh god, you're just you're 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 not my doctor, you're a twelve uh, a, a tribunal hater and a thirteenth doctor hater. No, absolutely freaking love Jody and I really wish that I connected with this era more. I really do wish that I re- I connected with it more. Um but if anything here this is proof positive that I do connect with the stuff that Chris Chimmel has written because I really like this two parter. I remember really liking it when I revisited it for Time Team. What's your memory of this one? You would have watched this go out. You would have watched this go out in 2010 yeah. initially. Um, have you revisited this one since? No. Oh, when, do it's been 11 when... year, year, 11 year and trying. Do you remember when it first came on? I thought it was the one where he t- like people. The, made the Rebel Flash, the plastic, all those people. Yeah, mm, no, yeah. We'll get, we'll get to it. We'll get yeah. to not. No, yeah, no. We'll get to it. What's happening? Um, so I was like, oh yeah, I remember this one. <laughs> and then we, <laughs> you said, no, no, it's not that one. I was like, oh. Then I don't remember know. nothing. Oh no, it's the one with the um, Santarans, isn't it? You didn't say Santarans. Did I you not? said you said Silorians, and then you went, no, that's not right. And I didn't want to say anything because they hadn't been revealed at this point in the story. And then, because obviously you've now lived through the classic era, so there's that you've got that extra little in now that a lot of people did when they watched this one go out, which is, oh my god, it's the Silurians! We're doing a Silurian story. Is this the first time you see the Silurians? No. In the modern era. Is yeah. it? Is it yeah. really? Uh, this is this is the first and only Silurian. <gasps> God's sake. God. This is the first and to date only Silurian story of the modern era. She took me leg off. We have had th- th- there has been a recurring Silurian character since this story, right? Um, but this is the only Silurian story, which I think is right because they're again they're monsters that are remembered very fondly by people who grew up with the original run, especially obviously the Pertwee era. But they were only in. Th- this version of them was only in two stories. Doctor Who and the Silorians yeah. and uh, Warriors of the Deep. Um, A.K.A. have a karate chop fight with a Chinese dragon Loch Ness monster thing in a corridor. One of my favourite movies. It was so bad so and we had so much fun watching bad. it. Um, and and, and you know, there's going to be people screaming out there now going, but what about the sea devils? Yeah, fine, yes, it's similar, that's the point. That's why Warriors of the Deep is fun because they finally, both of them appear in a story and you see that two different factions of the, the species that originally had Earth like, go to war with each other. Mm-hmm. But what's sort of interesting with this is they kind of combine the two of them in the aesthetics, which I like. Like, the way the warriors are dressed, there's this netting in the costuming, same with um, General Restak. Um, is that her name? It's Restak, isn't it? Uh, she appears in part two, so she's not in the credits of this one that I've got on my screen. Um, yeah, so, uh, like, there's netting in the costume, like the sea devils have, because they just wear big bloody nets, nets don't they? Yeah. Uh, these guys kind of, the head shape is a little more like the sea devils in that it's that... Uh, the sea devils at their neck kind of fin outwards. Yeah. Whereas the Silurians were more kind of, they were little triangular sort of points Thin on headed. their head. So this sort of meets halfway. That's sort of, too. Nope. Uh, this meets sort of halfway uh, between them. Yeah. Um, the weapons are very sea devil. I mean, do you remember the sea devil's weapon? Yeah, it looked like a like a, a big disc. Yeah. Well, no, not even a big disc. Well, there's the Silorian disc. weapon for this series. It's cute that they, you know, it's the same, but it's modern. Yeah, but it's not it's a Silorian. But... stuck on the back. Yeah, but it's not a Silorian weapon in the classic series. So they've kind of mixed and matched, mixed and matched, mixed and, yeah, that makes sense. They've mixed and matched everything together. What confused you? <laughs> Words, Words. Um, at this point, which I think is nice. They sort of pick and chose, but they also made a key decision in the design, which is in the originals. Obviously, the Silurians have got very set in rubber carved faces with their, yeah. their little pursed lips and everything, and they have like they don't have weapons. 
because they have the psionic ability because they're like a hive mind they communicate mm. psychically they've mm. got the little third eye yeah. in the forehead yeah. and that's how they defend themselves and it was cool because they all looked slightly different yeah there's a slightly different hues and a different couple heights of different heights different heights definitely that the sculpt cool, yeah. so here they've gone well, we're going to halfway house but we really I totally understand the decision here whether this was uh, Moffat's call or whether it was Chibnall in the screenplay you know the script mm. or whether it was just you know Millennium FX and all the design teams working together they made a very, very smart decision here because this story really is like and the Silurians, especially in its latter half. This is about power balance and the politics and whether it's right for us to have the planet when these guys had it first or whether it's right for these guys to aggressively demand it when yeah. millennia have gone by and it isn't their planet anymore. And mm. it's not like they were put there by us so we've not punished them. Mm. And, and obviously it leads into part two, the diplomacy of the idea of can we negotiate a coexistence between humans and, and homo reptilia? Like, yeah. can it happen? Yeah. Um, it would have been ridiculous to have those sorts of scenes and, and dialogues if you were looking at a rubber mask with big old duck lips. So they went, let's make them look like people. Let's see the performer. They want to look like lizard people. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I can turn anything into a song. So what is the basic plot of part one? What's the basic plot? They think they're going to Rio and then... Um... <laughs> yeah, sure, that's in there. Yeah, absolutely. Which is why Amy's got her legs out, I guess. But the doctor's like... Her legs out and a scarf. <laughs> mm, we're here because there's something going on. Uh, let's have a look. And there's tremors, but they are well. They're they're in a Welsh mining village, is where they've ended up, isn't it? Like yes. a Welsh mining so, spot. So the doctor's like, "Hey, let's go have a look." Oh, what year was it? It's not. F it's not far in our few in in our. F it's not too far behind us. Twenty twenty. So nobody's masking up. Nobody's got masks. They they were social distancing because Amy and Rory were waving from across the way. Maybe that's why they stayed over there. Oh, it wasn't to mess with time. No. Uh, yeah, so they, they, they get out the TARDIS and the first thing they Wash see... Wash your hands. Take out <laughs> stock in Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> and hand sanitizer. Buy, spend 2019 buying nothing but toilet roll, pasta and Purell. <laughs> Just buy it all. And flour for some reason. Yeah, it's weird. Anyway. Um, so they see themselves. Amy and Rory see themselves in their personal future, waving back at them. Which is cute. From across the valley. And there's like, what are we doing there? And the Doctor goes, I don't know, like, sort of reminiscing. Like, obviously you and your personal future have decided, oh, we're going to be there that day, let's go and wave. And that's kind of a cute idea, the idea that they would sit there, knowing the TARDIS is going to appear over there at some point, watch it, be like, oh my God, there we are, isn't that cool? And give them a wave, and move on. And that starts up a wonderful little thingy where... Rory's like, oh, isn't that cool? Carrying on from the Amy's Choice themes of what everyone personally wants out of their life. Mm. Rory's like, isn't that amazing? And Amy's like, what? One day we just give this up? And you're like, oh. So there's already a little bit of that conflict of what they want their future to be. Um, but the Doctor's too preoccupied, like you say, with the drilling. Yeah. A big old drill, drilling down into the earth because it's a popular site for scientific excavation, specifically the stuff led by Nazarene Chaudhry, played by Mira Sayal, who is freaking wonderful in this. I mean, everyone's great in this, but she's very much a, yeah. oh, I could see this character joining him for a series yeah. kind of character. Um, and Robert Pugh as Tony Mack. Uh, they're in charge of the expedition. Tony's daughter, um, Ambrose, played by Nia Roberts, who does a great sort of, um, very kind of, uh, how do I put this? Shakespearean feels like I'm overstating it, but you know what I mean. I know exactly. A character who is dealing with a lot and makes a lot of the wrong decisions in the name of keeping her family safe. Um, yes, yeah, so, so Ambrose is around and her son Elliot, played by Samuel Davies, who is one of those unique uh, breeds, as in, is a child actor who's actually really bloody good. Mm. <laughs> really good, can't fault him. Yeah. Um, Which is so rare. It's so rare. Um, I said that, though. I think the last few episodes that we've had kids in it... They've been quite good. Really Andy, good. Pryor so always does, Andy Pryor always does a good job. I don't think there's ever been a really bad kid performance in Modern Who. There's been a few that make you go, oh, this character's annoying. Yeah. Like, we've got yeah. we've got one coming up in Series 8 who's really annoying, and, and one in Series 2 in Series 7 who are kind of annoying. Um, but, yeah. 
Uh, we've got one in Series 6 who's not annoying, he's wonderful, but his voice is just really distracting. Have you come to take me away? I haven't seen that We one. met him really briefly, do you remember? When I went to record the gunpowder plot. I, I played Barnaby in the gunpowder plot game, and Barnaby's younger brother was the one who'd gone missing. <laughs> and it was played by the same actor who was in Night Terrors, and he was in he was at the studios at Big Finish before we like went in proper. But well, it was just you, me, and Gary hanging out outside getting ready. Right. Do you remember Gary went back into the studio to do some work because he was finishing getting those lines done with that lad, and then he went out to the courtyard to have his behind the scenes bit shot, and we got set up in the studio. I was just sat there to be honest, just like in awe of like what? It was what's a fun, a fun afternoon though. Wasn't yeah, it? they were so nice. It was a really though. cool afternoon. Uh, you didn't get to have the famous big finish lunch though because we'd arrived like mid afternoon. Yeah, I didn't care. I was just really proud of watching you work and people getting really excited about you. Bless your eyes. I was just excited being in the voice booth. My second time in a voice booth at that studio, and um, just like <laughs> no, it's my third time actually. My third time being in a voice booth at that studio, and just looking at all the autographs that people had done, little messages they'd scribbled on the 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 um, the, the mic stands and the easels. Mm. They were, writes the name and has a little faff around. My name is How on one. Is it? My name is on one of them somewhere. So if anyone ever watching this records a big finish, look for my name on one of the stands. Um, well, I heard they chucked it out. Oh, yeah, they set fire to it. <laughs> Straight from my recording. But, uh, yeah, so so uh, Elliot's fantastic, played by Samuel Davies. Uh, the reason the site is great, there's this grass, this plant life that grows there that hasn't been known on Earth for billions of years and is apparently dead. Yeah. But it's here. Mm. So they're digging because they want to write what nutrients it's, it's are like here, blue, what, is it yeah, what is it that's in the ground, what is it that's in the soil. We have to find out. Um, bad things are going on because the night before, Mo. Uh, Ambrose's husband, Elliot's dad, played by Alan Raglan, who is an absolute joy. Yeah. I, I got to work with him at CBBC. He did work on the series Wolf Blood, and um, uh, played a, played a villain in Wolf Blood. And he, he did some CBBC stuff with us, and he was really funny. Um, he uh, he gets dragged into the earth in a genuinely terrifying effect, and unfortunately, we'd seen that effect. <laughs> well, I mean. I knew it was coming because I've seen the bloody well, stories a million times, but I know what you mean. But we, we were looking at special features a bit on these discs and we were yeah. flying through them. And the video diaries on the Blu-ray are all about stories that are on the next disc. So we got to watch this brilliant like video... Di- yeah, I miss the video really... diaries on the behind-the-scenes yeah. thing so much. But we got to watch the, this brilliant video diary of Karen Gillan talking about doing that stunt and about how it is one of her like personal fears, the idea of being buried alive. So she was having to really like gear herself up for this this yeah. this stunt where it was because like, it's all a practical effect her being dragged under the soil and um, Alan Raglan had to go through the same thing and it it really makes you appreciate like the stunt coordination and the practical effects on on show at this point in the series and her going for it and challenging herself and now she says that it's mostly the first take they're going to use but you can if you, if she looks terrified it's because she's terrified she's, yeah it's real. Um, and it's a really scary effect, but it's a shame that we sort of watched that special feature two or three stories early. It was like, oh, for God's sake, come on, Blu-rays. Um, but yeah, we get split up. Amy gets taken down into, we find out as a, you know, like pre-prehistoric um, settlement, a Silurian city that's way bigger. Because the doctor like brings up, he's like, yeah, no, I've met them before. Yeah. It's like, this is a different branch, it seems, but I've I've met them. And there was only like a, it was a group of like six or seven waiting for time to wake up everyone else and mm. la la la. And of course, when him and uh, Nazarene get down there, it's like, oh god, no! <laughs> like, no, this is this is a city of tens of thousands at the least by the time they're awake. And as we learn over the course of the two, let's talk about both parts. Let's just talk loosely. Yeah, about it. It is, we yeah. we learn we learn obviously that not everyone's awake yet, but because of the drill, the reason the Silurians are waking up here is because the drilling has triggered off like the defence systems and has woken up the military from hibernation. Yeah. Um, namely, the uh, the military led by uh, General Restak, played brilliantly by Neve McIntosh, making her Doctor Who debut as her first of three uh, characters, all Silurian. Um, and Restak is basically like, right, the apes are attacking us, now is the time, let's get up there and screw them over. I hate everyone and everything except my sister, let's go. So she sends up, like, the first wave to attack. Like, they drag people down and so that the, the scientific uh, officer can essentially dissect them. Um, 
assigned self for certain years. Let's look him up because he's only the cast of the second one. Malake, played by Richard Hope. He does a great job because he's quite scary in part one. When you, yeah, ba- when you barely um... get to know him or see him really, and he's just sort of like mysterious. Then part two, you get to know him a bit more and you realise it. No, he's a good egg. He thinks he's doing the right thing. And when he realises, oh God, like, no, ah, he's, he's like, oh, shoot, I'm sorry. Like this, I wouldn't have done it this way had I known. I'm really, really sorry. The vibe I got from him was when you know you watch, <laughs> like, Overlord. Really? He wasn't that scary. And, you, and there's the, like, the Nazi doctor. I'm not comparing him to a Nazi. That's not what I'm doing. But, like, the crazy doctor that's doing experiments on people. That's, that's the vibe I got. And I was like... <gasps> and you realise, no, it's just, this is how they... Yeah, which I think is how you're supposed to feel, not the Nazi thing, but... Mm. <laughs> you're meant to be scared. Yeah. Amy's put through the ringer in this. Bless her. Um, <laughs> as is Mo, who has been dissected whilst awake. <sighs> it's rough, that. Yeah, pretty freaking rough. Um, the first wave got up there, and the team... Because obviously it's now separated and you have this horrible moment where Rory realises that Amy's gone. Mm-hmm. And um, the Doctor's like, I'll get her back and I'm going to get Mo back. And then Elliot gets stolen away. After, again, Matt has some wonderful scenes with Samuel David. The Doctor and Elliot have some wonderful yeah. little exchanges. Especially the bit where he's like, go around town, like, right. Where he's going to hack into the security camera so they can find someone coming up from the surface, for, up to the surface. And he's like, right down the position of all of them. He's like, ah, it might be a little tricky. I'm dyslexic. And he says, well... Draw a map like you've never drawn a map before. So he goes out and draws a map. It's like, brilliant. He doesn't even skip a beat. He's just sort of like, yeah, we'll draw a map. You've got it. And it's like, oh, okay. And off, off Elliot goes and does thing. That made me think like, hmm, maybe one of his doctors has been dyslexic or maybe he is dyslexic. Hmm. Well. Um, but it's it's those, it's a little thing that makes that would make a child feel very inclu- in- included in the scenario. Which is also wonderful because this is the first story where we see him put a little too much faith. Um, not not put too much faith, sorry, but be so comfortable around a kid mm. that he neglects to remember that he is just a kid. Yeah. When Elliot pops out to get his headphones, the doctor's like, yeah, you'll be fine. And then they have to do an emergency lockdown in the church. Emergency lockdown. That, I love that moment when um, when um, Ambrose like bollocks him for it because mm. it's completely right, isn't it? It's like you and you just let him go. He's a kid. And the doctor's like ah, like he sees everyone as equal that much that he forgets. Like yeah, sometimes you need to remember like the kids need to be protected, dude. Yeah. Like holy holy crap, That's- like. You know, yeah. outside the building, it, this is a scary moment. Well, they managed to capture an injured warrior. Uh, the Doctor and Rory lock her in a, in a white van. Um, we also get the first ever use of sunglasses being a, an accessory of the Doctor. Like he, he, he puts on sunglasses at, at night and they've got heat vision. So that's how he tracks one down. Oh, yeah. Wait, which doesn't really make any sense because Celerin's... Wouldn't they be cold blooded? That's the point. He's he's using a heat vision thing, and then he realizes it's registering the opposite, and he switches the filter, and he's like cold blooded. And then because he goes, "I know what you are," because that's when he that's that. that's when he twigs what they're dealing with. That's when he figures out. Hmm, maybe I'd lost something at the time when we were looking for it. They kidnap Alea. A scene here with an action figure that's got two right feet. It's the only Silurian figure I still have. I used to have a rest stack, and I used to have another Silurian warrior, and I've sold them both, but I kept Alea. Uh, she has two right feet, so technically she's a super rare cock up variant. Um, <laughs> cock up so, if anyone would like to send me £500 for her, she's yours. Why is she a cock up? Because she's got two right feet. Did you just say that? <laughs> Twice. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Are you doing something else? No. You totally are. I'm not. Right, anyway. I'm trying to see. Um, Is that why she fell over? That makes sense. No, she's on the floor. She's chained up. They capture Alea, and Neve McIntosh also plays Alea, and she does an incredible job with this character because this character is just, (laughs) oh, you morons. This is the start of the war that me and my, uh, uh, she doesn't say it outright, but it's obvious that it's her sister's, like, vibe. Like, she wants war. Are they played by the same person, then? They're played by Neve McIntosh. Both of them? Both of them are played by Neve McIntosh. 
wow, she does a really good job. She's great because they they make a few references of like she sh- there's, there's this weird thing with like she she's part of your uh, gene habit habitat or something like that. Yeah. They sort of make references that you're you're close. Yeah. The rest of us like shut up, that's not important. And then when she sees her dead, she calls her sister mm. and breaks down. Uh, they're both played by Eve McIntosh, who will go on to play one of the character in Doctor Who, Madame Vastra. When you said she played three parts, I was like... Two in this, one after this. No way. Yeah. No way. Um, but yeah, she... Uh, she, she uh, Alea's great, because she's, she's... Essentially, she's like a brainwashed soldier. She wants this to turn into war, and she's so determined for it to happen that she will manufacture the situation... Like, she uses psychological warfare while she is imprisoned to ensure that one of them has got... One of the people looking after her, to- out of Tony, Ambrose, and Rory, is going to kill her. Mm. And she she clocks early on that it will be Ambrose because she knows she's got the most to lose. Her husband's been taken, her son has been taken. She, she like, tongue lashes Tony when they're trying to catch her and it poisons him. And the poison's acting slower than she assumed, and that I like that because she's sort of like you should be dead by now. So it's kind of this implication that either he's really holding on, mm. but chemicals don't work like that. So I think it's more just like yeah, maybe when they've gone to the surface in prior generations for defense reasons, they've been able to kill you know Neanderthals or whatever easier. But like humanity evolves, it changes. It's, you know, it's ability to deal with viruses and diseases adapts and changes over like multiple generations so I, I kind of like that notion of like oh god so she knows that it should it should have killed him she, as, as far as she knows how often has she come to the surface for stuff um, how often then, has Restak been looking for an excuse do you know what I mean mm. to, to start a war because that's how Restak believes the Silurians deserve the planet Earth which was the whole ethical debate of and the Silurians in, in the Pertwee era mm-hmm and uh, and obviously in this, oh Matt plays it so well. I wonder how much he was informed uh, in terms of the filming. But Matt plays this so well. The idea that the Doctor wants the opportunity in this arises to potentially have a solution to the Silurian issue where they can share the planet. You feel the weight of that original story lifted off of him. Mm-hmm. Like you, you feel that he has been. Because obviously, how does that story end? Do you remember. Like there's 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 like two Silorians essentially. I think there's definitely definitely one. There's like two that are like, yeah, we're gonna fix this. Like what the rest of us are doing. I think it was. Yeah, uh, what the rest of us are doing, they're doing this horribly wrong. We need to sort this. Yeah. But by that point, unit have already gone. Like, yeah, no, we can end this now. So by the time the doctor gets out and the the sort of the negotiations are possibly because that's the thing, is it? The leader gets killed and then another one yeah, replaces exactly. him. I was just gonna say that, yeah. And it's like, oh god, and it's, it, the tide turns. So it's like. There's a chance, but the brigadier orders the 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 um, the explosion and essentially killing all in the top level and submerging and caving in all the network tunnels in that Alistair. point. <laughs> Terrible job there. And, and you can see that, like the doctor is genuine. He, he's like, oh, the end. Of that, that story ends on such a bum note. It ends hurt, with him basically being he's, like, he's so angry. Yeah, it just basically ends with him being like, I see what you did, but. You're a dick. Credits roll. <laughs> Thrallister. You're a knobhead. You son of a bitch. <laughs> the credits roll. So it's, it's obviously sat on him, and I wonder if Matt was informed of that. Like, you know, so here's the very first time he met them. Here's what happened, and here's this, and the other. Mm. And it's set like 50 or 40 or whatever years uh, before this one in terms of Earth's timeline. So this is the chance. Um,. I love the second half. I mean, the first half I think is expertly done. Like the act- there's tension. It's really creepy. The stuff with the earth, like actually dragging you into it, is really eerie. Um, Rory being a perfect companion in part one is such a great subtle setting up of what part two does to him. Yeah. Because in part one, he's mistaken as a police officer, the one that um, the one that Ambrose called. And he goes along with it to learn what's happening, and you can see that he's kind of like he's he's picked it up a bit by now. Yeah, he's a few adventures in, he's picked he's up this kind pace. of just like going along with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's great. He's brilliant. He he's the one who like he's the only one who is not going to snap. 
when their job is to just like his and Ambrose and Tony's job is to just monitor a layer. Well, if you think about it, he was he was he's a nurse, so he yeah. deals well under pressure. Well, as soon as Thingy, um, uh, she stabs her, doesn't she? She stab her? Mm, no, she she, she tases her. her. She tases her in the chest. Oh my god! She, she, oh, she yes. tases her yeah, in the yeah, chest. Yeah, yeah. Um, and immediately Rory's like, no, I'm not letting you die. And he goes over to see what he can do. But Alea's obviously just, she's just leaning into that pain. She's like, nope, this is it. It's like my death. Oh, you idiots. My death is going to start this war. I cannot wait. I mean, obviously I, I, I won't be here, but still, bye. Yeet. And then she dabbed and then she died. <laughs> I don't think that's how it happened. She totally dabbed. She totally dabbed. Um, and she was like, Jokes on you, fuckers! This is how the coronavirus <laughs> starts. No! no. In part two, obviously, we get uh, the addition of Eldane as well, played by Stephen Moore, who does a really bloody good job. Um, Eldane uh, is sort of, like, I guess, the acting leader or the acting um, head of, uh, of 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 the you know the. What do you call it? What the Silorian, the the Silorian, uh, uh, group that's there, like the the the, the yeah, yeah the colony. 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 Yeah, colony, 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 um, colony, and and Stephen Moore does a great job uh, at selling the idea that like he's old enough, like they imply that he's very old and he's been awoken like every now and again to just kind of Check see where things. everything is because the because the warriors the, the the military are in like a stasis state where they could be triggered in a mo- at a moment's notice. Mm-hmm. In fact, hang on. Alea's dead, so let's get rid of Alea now. Alea can go. Bye, Alea. T- take the chain off. Um, so the warriors are, are prepared and ready to just do their thing the moment they're asked. Um, even without being awoken properly. They're just sent up. They're, they're woken up, and they're immediately put on these transport discs that will take them to the surface. <laughs> and then they will go and hurt whatever they've been told to hurt or kill. Oh. Simples, um, and you get the sense that Eldane has resigned to the idea that his species might never get the chance, or at least while he's alive. But he's more worried about how destructive elements like Restak are becoming mm. than he is about his species making it to the surface. Like that, to him, is more frightening because mm. he's like that will ruin our species' chance of ever integrating. Um, or, you know, finding our place. There they are. Oh, no! God damn it. You're not, you're not a lady. You have to stand up. No. You've got to do your thing and stand the stand stand on your two no right more feet. sitting down for you, son. Sitting down no more. That's how it goes, right? That's John Hurt between takes on Day of the Doctor. It's like, I've got to get up now. Sitting down no more. Um, forward. Yeah, but look at the disc though. Like that's that's the actual little disky disc. That is the one they used in the episode. Oh my god, her two right feet are absolutely screwed. Um, so yeah, stand up, you bugger. There we go. Uh, I also don't you freaking dare. <laughs> I also really like their uh, the the predator masks. I forgot to say that. Mm. So sort of heat vision mask. It's a nice touch, and it and it's a bit more sea devil in its shape. So you sort of get a little little nod to sea devils. And it's fun because kids could buy them and wear them. I think there was a toy version of the mask. That's why I said it. I think there was. It was it was all over the marketing. Do you remember the 3D trailer, the one of the Doctor and Amulet like, on the grass, and it explodes into a vortex, and they're flying through all these bubbles, you saw like Daleks, Smilers, and Weeping Angels, and then at the very end, like everything settles, and then that face, like the mask, like this giant version that like, erupts through the ground. Mm. It was like, oh! everyone was like, what is that? And then it was like, oh, it's just a mask that some aliens wear during the series. We just wanted some spooky imagery. <laughs> it wouldn't spoil anything. So, like, oh, okay, fair enough. Um, Stephen ah, Moore. jokes on you, it's an alien that you've not seen for a while. Did you, speaking of aliens you've not seen for a while, robots rather, did you recognise Eldane's voice? Because obviously he does the narration at the top of the episode and you sort of get the, a narration from his point of view in the future as well, implying that he's going to wake up again and think back on that time. Yeah. Did you recognise his voice? I recognise, I kind of, I know it sounds really weird because he had, obviously had loads of prosthetics mm. on his face, mm-hmm. but I kind of recognised his face. Well, I don't know what you would have recognised his face from, but you'll definitely recognise his voice if he'd have done a deeper voice and told you to not talk to him about life. Life. 
don't, don't talk, talk to me about life. It's the voice of... Uh, God, I'm depressed. It's the voice of Marvin the Paranoid Android in the radio and TV series. <laughs> There's, there's, so your, there's your Hitchhiker's Guide crossover oh. for this one. <clears throat> Lovely. Um, so yeah, uh, I I love the t- I love I think the highlight of this one is the 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 wonderful scene where you actually get the negotiation happening between um, Nazri and Amy <laughs> and Eldane. I think that's wonderful. Where they start to actually come to a compromise, mm. and the fact that the Doctor's like, "Do it," because Amy's like, "But hang on, lizard people." They can't share the planet. It's like, right, here's the thing. There are fixed points in time and there are things that are always in flux that we can always try and always change mm-hmm. that won't affect the grand scheme of the pattern of the universe and how time is meant to go. This is one of them. This is a tipping point. This, like, you say that, oh, but we, we were on Starship UK and it was just people. Yeah. Doesn't have to be. Like, that could change right now. So what we're waiting for, let's go, bruv. Let's go, fam. You know, let's do it. That scene's wonderful. The best scene in this, and it is down to the writing, the direction, and the performances, and it's one of the best scenes in this series, is the bit... Oh, my God, it's so good. Where Mo, Amy, the Doctor, and um, Nazreen are going to be executed unless Rory, Ambrose, and Tony bring a layer down to the uh, the, the temple. Mm-hmm. And she's already dead by that point. It's just like, oh, how good was that? That entire like five minutes of them going like, right, we'll let them go because they're on the way now. Here they go. And the and doctor was is, is kind of already <clears throat> knowing what's happening. You can kind of tell from the way that Rory's behaving. He's like, yeah, it's like something's behaving. off. It's as soon as they arrive there, isn't it? He sort of looking at him, he's like, okay, what's... What is it? Like, oh, it's just... Because you just know that it's 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 the powder keg is there and the layer's death is the match. Because Restak is only going to take it one way. I love the when nice she's metaphor, man. I love the when she's dead. Like they realize she's dead. The doctor immediately turns to Elday and he's like, "I didn't know. Like I did not know. They are meant to. They are not. As he says to it, like they are not the best of humanity. Like making a reference, especially to Ambrose. Like she's yeah. not the best of humanity." She is not. Like, they are capable of so much more than this. Like, please. You can tell that he's just like, shit. Like, it's all going to cry. He's not worried about them dying at that moment. He's worried about this future of the Silurians finally getting what they kind of sort of deserve and sort of mm. need. Yeah. It's it's going to happen. It's going to... It's, it's, it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen. No, it's going to tip this very, very fragile scale of full, full out mass war mm. or peace the uh, two um, species living together in peace yeah this um race has obviously got you know advanced technologies and they can help well, that, that, that's other. the compromise it's like we'll give you the space in exchange for like uh, you giving us your technology that can can help us advance and it's it's yeah I love it and I love that it doesn't end it doesn't end definitively do you know what I mean? Mm. Like it ends with a with a pin in it. It ends with a we'll get back to this specifically because Tony Tony could be cured of the poison, but he's got very limited like time. It, he'd have to be woken up later, so Tony's going to stay there and be worked on uh, by Eldane because uh, Malachi gets killed by Restak. Yeah. Um, Nazarene's going to stay with him. I love the setup of that relationship. I think it's cute as hell. In part one, where like they think it's everything's gonna go to pot, and she kisses him, and she, he kisses her, and she's like, "Tony," like, and he goes, "Well, come on, so like as if he didn't know." And it's like and little little stuff like that. I think later later Chibnall doesn't do it as well as earlier Chibnall. In there's a lot of show don't tell, yeah, and like that's wonderful because you instantly go, "Oh, they have history," like you get it. You know what I mean? Like they've fancied each other for ages. Yeah, yeah. it's like, okay, all right. And then she's like, yeah, I'm staying down here. And the doctor's like, why? Why would you do that? She's like, because my life's work has been like going into this and trying to figure out what these sorts of, like the origins of these kinds of, you know, the biology and the and the the, the plant life and all this, that and the other. And I've, I'm, I'm not going to learn more than I am here. Mm. 
like let me stay and maybe we can you know when we get, everyone gets woken up maybe we can be the ones to help broker it all like yeah. let's do it um let's stay let's stay in <clears throat> contact with good terms and i love that she's like you know come and find us and he's like i will yeah. and i do wonder if we'll ever get back to that i hope we do at some point mm. um <laughs> dog stretching in the background uh, there's one last thing we do need to talk about, though. Ha! <gasps> Stood right on the wobbly bit of my knee. Rory was going to get engaged to Amy. No, he was already engaged to Amy. What the hell am I talking about? Why is he tells her to take her engagement ring off because he doesn't want it to get damaged yeah. on this adventure they're not planning. And he goes and puts it back in the TARDIS and he kind of has this moment where you, sort of, you see him kind of being like, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. It's not tomorrow anymore, but we're going to get there. We're going to get there. And he's really sort of chuffed about it. And then that ring in the box has way more significance by the end. Oh my god. Yeah, because take, one of the cracks... A, take a second shot. One of the cracks in time, one of these buggers shows up as they're escaping the Silurian colony. Restak shoots Rory. Like in her dying breath, she kills Rory. And then the light from the crack, which we know from the Angel 2 part, like once you're sort of part of it, you get wiped from history. It starts to take his... Because he dies before then. That's the thing that, that I always forget about this story until I watch it. It's not like he's like, oh, I'm injured, and then he's erased from time. He's dead. He's flat out dead. And then he gets erased from time. And you have this brilliant moment, this heartbreaking moment, where Karen Gillan has given it her absolute bloody all. Where Amy's just like, I can't... Well, first she's like, trying to stop the Doctor from pulling her, her away from Rory. But she's in the TARDIS, he's like, well, we have to go. It's like, I'm going to forget him. And he's like, well, you won't. Like, just think about him. Think about him. Like, do not let go. And you can see her really trying. And the last kind of sort of moments, these flashbacks of their time together, some stuff we've not seen before, some stuff from the last few episodes, you see suddenly flashes of, him, of him, his body instead and it's just that it, what i love about that is they don't say it it's never explained you know that this whole thing is so powerful like it's going it's going to she's gonna have to it's gonna be like a million in a one chance that she's gonna remember him yeah but i wonder whether or not she chooses to forget in that moment like inadvertently because the, she suddenly starts remembering he's gone like he's dead do you know what i mean it's just that kind of mix of it's so well played and then it's so well played moments later and she's like Right, we're going out. We're going. We're leaving now. What's what's happening? We need to get out of here. And she's just playing it like there's nothing wrong. And she's like, "What's the matter with you?" And, mm. like, and of course, he finds he he, he he sort of puts the ring away, doesn't he? he puts it in his pocket. I think when he in the TARDIS, he like finds it. And he's like mm, bugger, and he puts it away. It's either in this one or it's in a future one, and I've misremembered. I've not. It, it plays. A part, it does play. It. A, it does play a part in the upcoming stories. Yeah, it, well, it, like it, him having the ring in his pocket, he puts it away because he doesn't want her to find it. Be like, so what's this about? Do you know what I mean? Because he's but like, then, also, how the hell do I explain this? But also, it's my TARDIS. You know, it, I was nearly... Oh, that's just my engagement ring. I keep it there for... Emergencies. Emergencies. <laughs> Emergency engagement. I was going to propose to Vincent Van Gogh. Um, I really like The Hungry Earth, Cold Blood. I really like it. Um, I like it more as time goes by, and I think a lot of that is to do with the... The, the war storyline the 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 psychological warfare stuff in it um and the gut punch of of the rory switch at the end i think it's really really good uh, and we also get of course the little um the little moment where he reaches into the uh the crack because that's like, an explosion that's supposed to be something that's exploded to cause like do damage this big mm. wherever there's an explosion there's sh the shrapnel shrapnel yeah so we like as the crack is sort of starting to do its thing he like reaches in with, with a big old handkerchief and he just something clearly hurts him he managed to pull out some of it and the story ends he unveils it and what is it? it's a piece of the TARDIS and this is after Amy has seen herself over the way still watching and gives herself a wave Oh, there I am again. Oh, that's rough. It's like, oh my god. So, yeah. I re what do you think of the story? Do you like the story? I like it. It's 
you don't get as many two parts obviously in the modern series. So oh, oh uh, after sort of this this part of the Smith era has got a decent amount. Well, up to but, now. But then after that, <laughs> after that, it's sort of a bit. Yeah, they're not as common, but I think we got a bit fatigued with the story lasting twelve episodes. So I, I. What's she talking about? You got fatigued of the Dalek Master Plan back in 2018, which we didn't watch because only two episodes have survived. Oh, yeah. That's the only one that's 12 parts. I know, I was joking. Oh, it actually was 12 parts. Oh, my God. I mean, technically, Trial of Time, technically, Trial of Time Lord's 14, but it's four separate short stories, so it works better as a um, result. But I mean, like, a lot of... You know, the Blu-ray for the Trial series is one of them that you can watch. I think it's Terror of the Vervoids. You can watch it edited as though it's just the adventure that the Doctor and Mel are on. I think I would rather that. That's kind of cool though, right? Yeah. I wonder what happens in the moment where like he sort of reverses and everything and there's bits clearly cut out and that. I wonder how that's worked around in the edit. All right, go on. They don't do anything. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, he's just stuck there for ages. Just... <laughs> zip, 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 zip. Um, zip, 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 zip. Um... <laughs> so, uh, two parters still in the back of my mind are a bit like, oh. Really? Yeah, two because, parters? Yeah, but because I always think in my head, you could tell this so much quicker. But this one, it really didn't feel like it. I mean, I, I'm not saying that all two parters feel like that, but I just get so that, you're saying this that one, little sense at the beginning of it, like, oh, God. This was a really good hour and a half TV movie. Yeah, it didn't feel sci-fi. like it didn't feel like it dragged, didn't mm. feel like it was, you know, the opposite rushing for time. I thought it was really, really good. Should we talk about another one which I know you think is really oh sorry, how? <laughs> Should we talk about another one which I know you think is really, 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 really good? Really, really, really. Okay, please don't push the table. Mm. For various reasons. One, there's a drink on it, and there's also my phone balanced on the edge. And two, because you're distracting from actually talking about things. Which episode do you think is really, 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 really good, which is also the last one we're talking about today? Vincent and the Doctor. So you're going to have to say that louder with more aplomb. Vincent and the Doctor. What's the plot of Vincent and the Doctor, sir? Uh, the Doctor's taking Amy all over the place to cheer her up. And she's like, I don't know why you're doing Why are you doing this? What's going on? You're never this nice. And he's like, well, I just want to take you to places that you want always wanted to go. So they go to... Uh, Musée d'Orsay. Excuse me? The Musée d'Orsay. You said that. You're so northern. Musée d'Orsay. Musée d'Orsay in Paris. They go there. This makes more. Um, to look at what? To look at Vincent van Gogh's paintings. Mm. It's a special exhibition full of his paintings. Mm. And Amy's very, very excited. And one of her favourites is um, one with a church. What was it called? Can't Ow! Remember, can't remember what that one's called now. Let's have a little look at it. It's uh, the Church at Over. Okay, Over. so... That's one of her favourites, and she's in there looking at it, and the doctor's like, mm, "Well, heck's that." Mm. Um. I know evil when I see it, and that and there's something in the window, which is a line that um, I've seen a few people mention before. Is like that's a bit mean, knowing retroactively what the Crefeus is and everything, like including the review of death they mentioned on there. Talk about it, and I'm like, I don't think I don't think he's saying that creature is evil. I think he can sense that this thing was painted out of fear, like. This thing was painted as something that is evil and terrifying and is haunting and, and scaring everyone, specifically Vincent. So it's, you know, you could draw a picture of a mouse and make it look like a horrible monster based on how you draw it. Yeah. So that's, that's just... Perception. Yes, yeah, perception thing. So I don't think the Doctor's saying, that's a Crefeus and it's evil, because he doesn't know what it is at <laughs> that, that point. It looks like a space chicken. Yeah, he doesn't know what it is at that point, but he can sense how thingy felt when they painted it. Like, mm. this picture has been drawn because... Well, this is it, what it's making it's, it feel. It's not supposed to be there. Well, yeah, as far as he's aware. Um, because da, 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 da. they go back to uh, they go back to specifically. Let's have a look at the TN. Um, they go back to uh, Ovis Oiz. I can't pronounce it correctly, but it's on the outskirts of Paris in 1890. They find Vincent. Cause they, well, because they double check with the curator that's there. Yeah, the, the the museum sort of curator and guide, a character called Dr. Black, who's played by an uncredited Bill Nye. Why is he uncredited? I guess because they wanted it to be a surprise. Because it's a small part, and it's obviously, like, this episode is written 
probably, by uh, Richard Curtis and Bill Nye is in a lot of Richard Curtis's films. So I think it was obviously his casting is a bit of a nod to, well, it's a Richard Curtis thing. Come on, let's get Bill Nye in it. But if you'd have said, and Bill Nye's in it, it would have taken away. That would have been, oh yeah, that would have absolutely, every headline about the episode in the lead up to it would have been, oh, and Bill Nye's going to be in it. I wonder who he's playing. Let's speculate on who Bill Nye's going to play. Yeah. Whereas the focus of this episode is absolutely on Tony Curran as Vincent Van Gogh, who does an astounding Amazing. job. Amazing. So I totally get why Dr. Black is uncredited. And good grief. And it's just a nice surprise. It's like, oh, Bill Nye. It's like when John Cleese freaking pops up at City of Death and just go, oh shit, John Cleese. Nowadays you go, oh shit, John Cleese. Uh, anyway, sorry, carry on. No, oh, nothing is sacred anymore. Um, no, he might be dead by the time this goes out, so let's... I'm not, I'm not saying that in a hopeful Jeez. way. I'm saying that in a, people might go, oh, is he not heard? I don't know. We're recording this in the past. Anyway, carry on. He's using hyperbole. Um, Michael Palin is still the best Python. Carry hey, on. Yay, because he is an angel, I hope. Anyway. Um, Hopefully he still is. What was I saying? Oh, I forgot what I was saying. Vincent Van Gogh. Dr. Black. Tells them that, like, oh yeah, that was painted around this place. That I was like, around, uh, give me a ballpark figure for the date. He sort of like gives like a three day window where it might be. And he's like, that's really good. By the way, the bow ties are very good. Dude. So they're bow like, ties he, are cool. He's like, yeah, I like yours too. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, you're thank, so cute. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going. And they go to Vincent Van Gogh. Um, Vincent's troubled, as he was at that stage of his life, very, very troubled with nobody, nobody severe liked depression. Um, nobody, he was a, a very very struggling artist because nobody appreciated his... Well, he was seen as a bit of a madman, work, wasn't yeah. he? People were just like, this strange guy who's well, just like painting stuff that no one bloody likes and he's just, what a, what, a, what a dickhead. He had a lot of mental health problems as oh God, yes. we have, you know... Come to learn. In, the, in modern day, have come to realise that what people said he was mad for, he was actually... You know, probably had psychosis and. and I'll I'll look at I'll look you give the plot and I'll look it up so that we're not um, misdiagnosing him at all. So we're like so so the doctor and Amy get there and they they end up going down a street which is another one of the famous um, paintings that he does of a cafe mm. and they bump into him because he's being chucked out because he can't pay for his drinks he's trying to pay with his art. And um, he takes a little fancy to Amy because Amy's sticking up for him. Also, like he's like you're you're you're, you're um, Dutch like me. Your your accent, and it's because Tony Curran's got a Scottish accent. It's like such a nice little yeah, yeah, yeah. idea, like sort of playing on the joke from Fires of Pompeii. Like Donna talks in Latin. To yeah. The guy played by Phil Cornell, and he thinks she's speaking in like um, Gaelic or something. It's just, it's like, that's a fun little kind of, yeah. the way it all plays into each other. She, he's like, you're Dutch like me. She goes, no, the doctor's like, yes. So, <laughs> it's like, yeah, just mm, go with it. Um, yeah, so he, he, it, it was a mix. The, the things that were, he had severe depression, which was just, uh, it, which resulted in psychotic episodes and delusions. Um, he, he affected his his uh, physical health because he wasn't eating or drink eating properly, and he was drinking alcohol heavily to cope. Um, and uh, the pressures of his like abject poverty basically made everything ten times worse. Yeah. So uh, can relate. Well, I guess um, I guess his. Um, we're very privileged of not being flippant there, but yeah. You know, mental health affects us all. Yeah, it's it's twenty twenty two where you are, and Christ, it's a. It's a fun time to be a millennial. Uh, anyway. Um, so they end up yeah. staying with um, Vincent because mm-hmm. uh, they've got nowhere to stay. <laughs> yeah. they, they, well, I love they, that. They They're just sort of like, can we stay with you? Great. <laughs> He's like, I didn't say yes. <laughs> well, no, he said, Vincent said, have you got anywhere, have, have you got anywhere <laughs> to stay? Ah, <laughs> oh, Vincent, you're... You're too kind. <laughs> it's just like, that's such a such a Troughton kind. Of, I know. It's just there's a lot of there's a lot of Matt's Troughton influence in this story and the way he carries. It. I mean, Troughton literally gets a visual shout out in this one. We get to see him and and uh, and Hartnell. That was on the floor. Sorry, we get to see him. We get to see him and Hartnell in this story, which is quite nice. Um, so the 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 doctor wants to keep an eye on him, obviously, because he wants to see what this thing is that's that was in the window. It and turns out it's it's a an invisible threat that Vincent can see and other people don't believe is real. Do you get it? 
I think. Do you get it? And this is why I take so much issue with people hating the Crefeus as the as the obstacle in this episode. No. Because they sort of go, oh, we get it, it's depression, but Ultimate's just a big chicken. It's like, yeah, because guess what? It's not meant to be a villain villain. It's honestly meant to be a thing where you go, circumstances just sometimes result in this. People are just sometimes like this. People just sometimes have to deal with this pressure, with this fear, with this anxiety. It ain't pretty. No one asked for it, but you deal with it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter that it's a giant invisible chicken because that doesn't really, to me, take away from the message being said here. And it's still a fearsome thing. Yeah. Like, what, what's more frightening about it isn't that it's a big invisible chicken. What's more frightening about it is how the Doctor describes that these things just fly through the universe eating and beating the crap out of stuff that they find. But they're that savage that even their familial nature as a pack, as a flock or whatever, is that if one of them's injured, they just kick it. They just kick it to the curb and fly off without it. And occasionally a Crefeus just ends up somewhere on its own, scared and confused. Um, made even more complicated by the fact no one can see it. And they, they, they really stress that, that no one can see... In the logic of the show, no one can see this thing. Mm-hmm. They are invisible... To, to the human eye or to the you know Gallifrey and I like they are they're not perceivable yeah in the natural way Vincent can see it obviously the allegory is it's depression like that's what it is he can he it's very real for him and no one believes him or no one understands him the doctor and Amy is get again they're sympathetic and they never disregard him, but they'll never quite get what he's going through because you never can. Everyone mm. else, everyone's case is unique. Two people could both suffer with like, you know, bipolar disorder, for example, and they have completely different experiences. Yeah. It's not like it's a category. Mm. So, and I'm preaching to like the quiet here aspect, you know what I mean? I'm just generalizing no, for the sake of summing up the, the thing here. So, the explanation that Vincent can see it in universe is because he sees the universe differently. Part of why no one gets him at his time is because no one was ready to sort of look at his work and think about, like, you know, he's an he's he's expressionist. Yeah, mm-hmm. he's, it's, he, he's, again, I want to make sure I get that terminology correct. He's an expressionist painter, isn't he? Impressionist painter, sorry, post impressionist, where. He's interpreting the world. And you get that beautiful sequence at the end where we see it. We see essentially Starry Night in real time. Absolutely one of my favourite paintings in the world. And and the, the, the sort of the take on it in this is beautiful because it, it, it sums up like, why, is, why does his sky look like that? Because he's painting the wind. Like, he's colouring the wind in. Why the yellow streaks? Because the wind's going to blow the stars, isn't it? It's like right. But, so what's that big light? What's that big light there? That's the star. Why is it so big? Because it's burning bright, and he's looking at the color and the way that it radiates light, and how that's affected by the swirling winds around it. And it's that's how he, he yeah. envisions it. That's how he's interpreting it. And and they do some great stuff in this where he's absolutely drunk on coffee, <laughs> and he's like really kind of ranting passionately about why he feels the need to, to paint. And the Doctor's sort of like, okay. <laughs> like you tell them they're, they're amazed to be in his presence and actually spend time with him. But he's also a bit like, let's get you some nice, calming tea. <laughs> it's just sort of like, okay, bit much. Um, but it, it's, so of course he sees the Grafaeus because he's seeing like, he's not, they don't outright say that he can see it, see it. We, the viewers, see it, see it a couple times. Yeah. But it, it, like he's probably seeing the way that the air's moving, the way that light's changing around it. He can like hear it and see sort of the sound coming from it, and you know it's 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 a brilliant explanation as to why, in context, Vincent can see it because mm. of course he can. He notices stuff, or he notices stuff other people don't. He sees stuff in a way that other people don't. I love that. Yeah, I love it. It's so good. I think. The whole episode, obviously, being a metaphor for this, is as somebody that suffers from 
severe anxiety, unfortunately, um, it, it hits home. Yeah. It does. I mean, every little thing feels like it's a... Magnified. Yeah. The slightest Even, problem becomes the biggest conundrum. Yeah. Like uh, when he was just, when he just spontaneously started crying, it was like, that's rough because that happens. Mm. Um, you could be happy as, the happiest you've ever been in your life, one minute, and then something will enter your head, not even talked about, and you're spiralling downwards and you can't stop yourself. Just smack everything down. Exactly. Um, even the painting itself, we were talking about it at the time, you know, it being a church, it's somewhere, you know, safe and sacred and, you know. Especially for that period in history as well. Yeah. It's still it's still seen as an institution of, like, stability. Mm -hmm. Like, every town has one. Every town's got at least one. I mean, there's always <clears> that. Like it's sturdy, it's there, so it's almost like a beacon of, you know. Everything's Safety. fine. Everything's yeah, okay. Yeah. This is still here. Everything's cool. The hell is that in the window? Everybody, yeah. can, everybody used to consider church as a sanctuary. Um, Especially that humpback, uh, humpback fella. He bloody loved it. Humpback. Yeah, I was being facetious. Is he a whale? Of comedy. Yeah. Is he a whale? Yeah. <laughs> you, got, you just got it wrong, didn't you? Yep. Anyway, quas free Willy Modo. I tried. No. Point that's, is, that's a crime. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, and there's always that. You know, narrative of evil can't enter a church. But, and what's through the window? But there it is. But yeah. also, really, really strongly, your body is a temple. And there is a big monster in there that nobody else can see. And that's that's what hit me. <laughs> God. The heck is that? I'll be Matt here super soon. Oh my god. Oh my goodness, Matt is uh, here. We'll pick this back up in just a second. Hello. Uh, so yeah, in conclusion. What you're saying about it being like something evil and dark and scary lurking within what should be a sacred temple. Mm -hmm. But also, in universe, what's the Crefeus wanting? Safety. Sanctuary. Sanctuary. <laughs> it works on so many levels and and I... I think that's one of the one of the reasons why this one really sticks out. Another reason is the ending. The ending sequence that it's confirms rough. that it's they rough. you know, they didn't stop how things happen. Like Amy's sort of determined that they're gonna change things around and he's not gonna take his own life. But No. Like it, depression isn't as easy as that. It's not as easy a solve. It's just like, oh, one day might change everything. It's, like, no, it's an ongoing fight. Like, th they're not with him every day. Like, maybe they could have made a difference. Maybe they couldn't. But as the doctor points out, you get that wonderful moment where he says a life is a mixture of both good things and bad things. You know, the bad things don't um, like necessarily, like, cancel out the good exactly, things. Yeah. And the good things don't, you know... Um, don't always outweigh the bad things, but like when they do, that's you know that's what's important. That scene where they go back to the Musée d'Orsay with Vincent. Holy crap! That has got to be some of my favorite a favorite piece of acting I've ever seen. Really? Yeah. That that high the, from, from Tony Curran. Yeah. Because again, seeing... an uncredited Bill Nye. Does an amazing job delivering that thingy. We have the the, the non diegetic music mm -hmm. um, from uh, Athlete, um, which is a great track pick and it's a great use of it. But yeah, the fact that the camera just sort of mostly focuses on Tony Curran's face. He's going through the shock of getting in a spaceship <laughs> I love the bit before where they sort of preamble it's like well, that one's ketchup but that one's mustard what's this no don't touch that one <laughs> and this one makes it go absolutely tot so crank <laughs> I uh, in, in, him being obviously confused about that having travelled through space and time he's like what the hell's going on <laughs> going out into a world that is completely alien even though it's the same planet obviously different time yeah and seeing all of these people 
so passionate about something you think is absolute garbage about yourself. So many emotions. So many emotions. And he plays it so well because you can see all of those emotions in his eyes and on his face. Mm. And that it just it just seems so genuine. It's incredible. It really is. My we've talked about this before, like my my favourite doctor's Excellent Cake. My favourite series of the show ever f- from 63 onwards is that first series. I think that is, to my money, like, the best... If you said to me, like, what's the best series to watch? Yeah. It's that one. Yeah. My three favourite episodes from the modern run as of this recording, Midnight is still, like, up there. Oh. It's just... It's just brilliant. Um, Rosa is in there. Yeah. Rosa is so well done. It is. And this one, Vincent and the Doctor, and it's, it's because these are just individual stories about people mm. and the length people will go to under pressures, or under pressure or, you know, the, the fight that people are having to deal with every day. This one and Rosa pair quite brilliantly together, both being historicals and both having the, the alien threat be quite minimal in the grand scheme of the show's design yeah, and, and it's not legacy. The focus. Because it's more there to highlight the importance of the person and what they are going through. Yeah. And, and you know, obviously Rosa deals with social, racial prejudices and, 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 and uh, you know, f- tackles that and, like, what her stand meant. Yeah. And what she and her peers were under at that time and what everyone well, was under stand. at that time. No, no, yeah. But <laughs> like what, what everyone... To, no, no, that's, that's, that's good. Uh, what everyone at that time was dealing with, what everyone, uh, you know, every non-white member of this planet still has to deal with in microaggressions or direct, like, racism every day. Like, it focuses, that's what that story really is about. Yeah. And this story is about mental health. It is about... Um, self-preservation is about realizing the importance of you yeah yeah it's it's this is the show at its best and um we get bonus bill nye in it as well so how about you guys what do you think of hungry earth cold blood and vincent and the doctor do you enjoy this triple bill as much as we did let us know down below uh we will see you next time for Probably our greatest challenge yet, really. What? Uh-oh. Yeah. I mean, not only do we have my my second favourite finale of the modern run in uh, the Pandora opens and the Big Bang, mm-hmm. but we also have to try and remember a time when we weren't sick of James Corden. We'll These see you real soon, folks. Won't be filled with tea. They'll be filled with. 100% alcohol. Oh, wow. And we'll die. See oh. you never. Bye. Bye.